One of the most important skills for writing a good story or scene in a novel is the ability to write strong dialogue. I'm Molly Emmons, a creative writing instructor at Butte College, and I've written dozens of short stories and 10 finished novels, in addition to teaching creative writing for over 30 years and leading a novelist collection for 16 years. Just as important, I've also had experience acting in more than 20 plays and plays are pretty much nothing but dialogue. So this is one element of writing I feel quite confident about. So you wanna write a story and you wanna write good dialogue. The first thing to understand is what does dialogue do? Let me start by introducing you to what I've learned as a writer. This little padlet here is linked to the website um, that you're watching, the WordSpring website, and you'll be able to access every handout on it. And I'm starting with this one. And this is what I, as a writer, have learned. So first of all, dialogue is the easiest way to progress the plot because it can put people in conflict. It can reveal the goals and desires of round characters. It can be used to disclose plot points and complications. It can be used to reveal internal conflict as someone argues both sides of a point during a scene in their own head. The second dialogue is the best way to make characters more interesting. You give them a distinct voice and a style of speaking. You can show their emotions and add character description and detail. They will spill secrets and it can be juxtaposed with internal monologue. Third, dialogue should sound real. You don't have to make it eloquent or fancy. It's one of the most common errors is to try to use big words when writing dialogue. Give your characters short sentences instead that pack a lot of punch, but slow down. Don't spell it all out. Let the reader add the pieces of the plot together. Make them do a little work to understand. When you're writing dialogue, always practice saying your dialogue aloud, even if you have to whisper it. If you can't say it easily, rest assured your characters won't say it either. Also choose a distinct voice for your character. If all your dialogue sounds like the same voice, the reader will lose interest. If you have trouble coming up with a distinct voice, consider uh, some good places to hear voices. You can copy uh, the distinct characters found in TV shows, movies, YouTube videos, even books. I needed an old fashioned teachery voice. I read some Jane Austen. I needed a Gen Z character. I watched the new HBO hit Generation. I needed a cop from the Bronx. So I watched a De Niro movie and I needed to know how an 11 year old speaks. So I watched a sixth grade class do their history presentations on YouTube. The next thing you should know is dialogue is just one part of a scene. If you can't surround the dialogue with descriptions of the scene and setting, the expressions and motions of your characters and the interior monologue of the point of view character, you need to spend some more time living through the scene in your imagination. Luckily, we're gonna practice that in this workshop today. Big warning, dialogue is easy to do wrong. Nothing pops a reader out of a story faster than bad dialogue. Avoid having your characters tell each other information they both already know. Mother, the cops are coming. We must move the body we both know we have in a trunk in the attic. If it's a word you don't use in conversation yourself, don't have your character spout it out. Keep the diction believable and natural. And people speak in short sentences. Say your character's sentence aloud. If it feels too long, it most likely is. Generally speaking, people are not eloquent. Let important content tumble and stumble out in verse, not in grand speeches. And don't have your characters overuse each other's names in dialogue. Martha, I love you. John, I don't love you. Just cut those. In a scene with more than two people speaking, put the attribution, in other words, the dialogue tag about who is speaking, in front of the dialogue so the reader isn't caught halfway through the line thinking someone else was speaking. Hold up, 
read that line again. Very important, a balance between dialogue and narration is one of the decisions you make about each scene. The more exchanges of dialogue you use, the faster the plot should move. Don't let your characters talk a subject to death. Bear that in mind if you want a fast paced scene. Also use shorter sentences and paragraphs. If you wanna focus on revealing a character at a particular point in the scene, give that person more dialogue or have other characters talk about someone you wanna make more interesting. Interrupting dialogue with unexpected action is a great way to increase tension and heighten interest. Here are a couple of uh, rules. Use a dash, two hyphen marks at the end of a dialogue line to show interruption. Don't let dialogue die away. Kill it off decisively in each conversation because someone leaves or action ensues or you move the scene into a summary. Long stretches of dialogue cause a scene to lose gravity. It begins to feel untethered from action, setting, and description. Also, always give your characters something to do while they're talking. I've taken a lesson from George R. R. Martin, uh, the Game of Thrones author. Actions speak louder than words, so show your villain-leaning character, Jamie in this case, gently breaking horses while he's discussing whether to kill a child with his brother. Absolutely unforgettable. Significant information should usually come out in dialogue or at least be analyzed in dialogue. If you don't have someone for your character to talk to, add a character and bring them along to the discovery so they can talk it out. Not everything has to be in spoken dialogue. You can summarize some of the dialogue, especially if the reader already has the knowledge of what's being said. In your indirect dialogue, focus on the emotion instead of the content. If you're struggling to write dialogue, pick up recently written novels of stories where you remember there being good dialogue and read over a few scenes. I recommend Jim Butcher from of the Des Dresden Files novels as particularly good with contemporary feeling dialogue. Note how the author begins the dialogue. Often it's introduced with a bit of scene setting and summarizing. Other times it's quite abrupt. Make sure you know which one you want to do. Notice the purpose of the dialogue. What is revealed? What emotions come into play? How is the plot of characters changed by the end of the scene? Note how long each line of dialogue is and the voice and style for the speaker along with how it is attributed. So as you're watching someone else doing a good dialogue scene, definitely take notes. Note where you, the reader, find yourself feeling more tension or some other emotion and try to figure out how the author did that. If you wanna practice dialogue, I recommend nothing better than eavesdropping. Choose a place where you will be able to overhear two people speaking without their realizing that you're listening. Please be ethical about this. Don't listen in if it's a very personal conversation. With paper and pen or keyboard ready, record at least five exchanges or 10 lines of dialogue. Write the words exactly as they're written or as they're spoken. Read them over, deciding what the speakers got out of the exchange. Now comes the fun part. Go ahead now and add attribution for each line, make up names for the characters if you want to. Don't tell anyone that you listen to them in order to ensure their privacy. This practice can easily be misunderstood. Finally, when you're writing dialogue, write and rewrite your dialogue. Get rid of flabby dialogue, make it work harder. Hello again, she put down the book, smiling. Why had she expected to see him here? The young man's luminous eyes widened in surprise. You've come back. His voice was a bit hoarse, a raspy tenor. He stood in the middle of the floor as if afraid to come closer. She laughed, a short, courteous chuckle to put him at his ease. Well, yes, I was here yesterday, wasn't I? Damn, she was wearing her sleeping gown and just how translucent was it? Yesterday, it was almost a whisper and there was something of alarm in his tone as if he should have known the word, but couldn't quite pin it down. So this is just four exchanges of dialogue and the dialogue has very few words. Hello again, you've come back. Well, yes, I was here yesterday, wasn't I? Yesterday, that's all there is to the dialogue. But look at all the attribution, the interior monologue, the sounds and images, the description of setting. Um, 
they embellish the dialogue and make it very meaningful. And last but not least, work harder on dialogue when more than two people are present in the scene. When you have three or more people in a room talking, make sure their voices are distinct and their reasons for being there are different in order to progress the plot. If someone doesn't have a good reason to be there or contribute to the dialogue, get them off stage. Give every person a secret, give every person a tell, give every person a different style and make them all feel differently about what's happening. And then you'll have a dynamic dialogue scene. So those are all things that I myself have learned about dialogue as a writer over the years. But before we get too further, because I know I just laid a lot on you, let me make sure that we all understand the main terms related to dialogue. These are in alphabetical order. First is attribution. Attribution uses action, gestures, expressions, emotions, or physical imagery rather than dialogue tags to clarify who is the speaker of the dialogue. Uh, attribution is shown in the same paragraph as the dialogue, but in complete sentences separated from dialogue by a period. Give me that. She held out her hand and rolled her eyes. This part is the attribution. And notice it's in a separate sentence. We don't need to say she said or she demanded. This sentence itself carries that information. Then there's dialogue rules. And we'll go over those more in a minute. Dialogue tag. A dialogue tag is a word like said or a similar verb, asked, replied, cried, shouted, attached to dialogue. And it's used to identify who's speaking. It should be unobtrusive. Example, Harry said, Voldemort is back. I recommend you avoid the word replied as it displays lazy writing. Most of the time, action description or emotion attribution can be used instead of dialogue tags. And I'm gonna show you a handout on attribution in a minute. Indirect dialogue. This is an important idea to understand. It's when dialogue is reported rather than shown. Use this to summarize dialogue already shown in a previous scene. But you know, the two characters talking now may need to talk about it. Never use indirect dialogue to introduce important new revelations in the plot. Example of what not to do. Mary told them the next morning that there had been a car accident. This is indirect dialogue. And then make it direct. Example, Mary stood in the doorway gasping. There's been an accident. Come now, hurry. This is direct dialogue. Then there's interior monologue, also known as internal monologue. They both mean exactly the same thing. This is the unspoken thoughts inside a character's head to be formatted without italics in most cases, except when conveying a sense of immediacy. For example, oh no. Don't use quotation marks. Do use past tense. So here's a wrong and here's a right. Joe walked into the room. I wonder where Lucy is, he thought. I haven't seen her all day. Now notice, although this is his thought, it's being formatted just like dialogue, as if it's spoken aloud. Instead, do it like this. Joe walked in the room, wondering where Lucy was. He hadn't seen her all day. Notice we're in his head, but now this is past tense. Use interior monologue when the thoughts of the character are affected by the plot or to reveal character. Rule of thumb, use it more often than you think you should. Another good term for you to know is subtext. Subtext happens when there's story present, but it's not openly expressed in the dialogue or text. What goes unsaid is often very powerful. What you choose to have characters not say can create tension. What you choose not to describe can glue the reader to the page with curiosity. The last term I wanna make sure you understand is talking heads. This is the term I use when there are exchanges of dialogue without attribution or even dialogue tags. The reader may easily become confused as to who is speaking. And as there is no information provided about the scene or what the characters are doing there, the conversation exists by itself in a bubble of unreality. Writers who deliver talking heads do so usually because they haven't yet imagined the scene or the characters with any real depth. I'll give you a good example of talking heads right now. Found this on Facebook. 
and thought it was hilarious. My man comes home. Me, nervous. How was the store? My man, fine. Me, oh, thank God. Ran into Jolene. Oh, no. She mentioned you left kind of an intense voicemail. What if this didn't say my man and me anywhere? How was the store? Fine. Oh, thank God. I ran into Jolene. Oh, no. After about four lines, we wouldn't be able to figure out who was talking, right? So do please add setting, description, etc. Okay. I'd like to show you a few do's and don'ts of dialogue because there are some common mistakes that people make when they're first learning to write dialogue. For example, do start a new paragraph with each change of speaker. Do summarize dialogue when it recaps action the reader has seen firsthand. Do use indirect dialogue with no quote marks occasionally when knowing each word isn't important or doesn't set a tone. Do reveal plot points carefully. Make the reader work a little. Don't tell it all in one line of dialogue. Do reveal characters through interesting or distinctive word choices and varying styles of speaking. Make sure each speaker sounds different from the others but like him or herself. Do use attribution with each exchange of dialogue to add description, emotion, and action, and avoid talking heads. Avoid empty dialogue tags like replied, stated, asked, etc. Put attribution before dialogue in scenes with more than two characters to clarify who's speaking right away. Do have characters in, who are engaging in dialogue get cross purposes, sometimes even ignoring each other's questions and answers. Leave some questions unanswered. That creates tension. Leave room for subtext, something that goes unspoken. Use dashes at the end of dialogue to indicate interruption by the next speaker. Here's the example. Keisha gasped, I can't believe you. Shut up, Demetrius narrowed his eyes. Use ellipses, dot, 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 to show pauses and trailing off. Always put spaces between the periods. Don't put them right up against each other. Use three ellipses in the middle of a speech, four at the end of a speech. Now here's some don'ts. Don't have people tell each other information they both already know. Don't have speakers be overly eloquent, speaking in long flowing sentences, using words of four or five syllables. And don't be too realistic. Don't have your character say, um, as often as real people do, or overly represent accents, a la Huckleberry Finn, if you've ever tried to read that book. Don't curse except for occasional emphasis, even if you curse all the time in real life. And don't use offensive language in an effort to be street. It's just off-putting. Don't be too coy. Coy means you're holding something back. If you're too coy, while you think you may be mysterious, your reader is just gonna lose interest. Don't bicker. Did not, did too, is not conflict and it's boring. Um, watch the YouTube video, Hot Kool-Aid on YouTube, if you wanna see uh, people bickering and it feels pretty meaningless. Also don't waste time with obvious dialogue. Cut lines like, good morning, hello, how are you? The reader will assume their existence. Please don't overuse exclamation points, rule of thumb, one per page, except when signifying yelling. And like I said before, don't have speakers overuse each other's names. So um, those are the do's and don'ts. Some of them repeated what I had said before, but now let's, let's talk about the whys of dialogue. Why do people talk to each other? What makes an interesting conversation? Well, I like a good flirtation. For example, someone saying, I'd love to see that smile turned on me. Something like this can become, can begin a friendship if it's that kind of flirtation or a romance if it's that kind of flirtation. Don't hesitate to use these in your stories. Sometimes people have to use dialogue to analyze or realize something. Here's an example. I think these three discoveries are clues, but to what? Sometimes characters need to plot something. You and I need to take her down. Then there's what I call the poison friend, the person come, who comes and tells you the bad news and ruins your life. 
he's been cheating on you. Sometimes announcements come in the form of conversation or dialogue. The soldiers are on the next hill. We are getting married. It could be an accusation. The only reason you're here is to steal my wand or a confession. I'm the one casting the spells or I don't think of you as just a friend. Might be an interrogation. Why have you been coming home late? Could be dialogue being used for bragging. I'm the only one who can do the spell. There could be an invitation. Do you want to be my date for the prom? Sometimes we give instructions or provide a list, but only if it, they're amusing or interesting. There are only three ingredients in troll soup. Sometimes we use conversation or dialogue for warning. If you don't hand your sword over to the soldiers, they will execute you. Sometimes you can include um, an ultimatum in your warning, and this should always be in dialogue and never summarized. Good thing to represent in dialogue is someone's mental breakdown. I can't stop picturing you her in her arms. I just want to die. Breakups are good to put in dialogue. You've cheated on me for the last time. You'll find your suitcases in the hall. And another thing you can do in dialogue is have somebody share their memories. 12 years ago today, I met your father. Here's the types of conversations that make boring or meaningless dialogue. Please don't include in a story a what's for breakfast conversation. Anytime there's a good morning, a hello, a pleasant trees, some kind of meaningless chat, any kind of how are you, unless it leads to a huge um, reckoning. Uh, oftentimes people write this kind of empty dialogue because they really don't know what to have their characters say to each other. Another thing to avoid is the here's what happened dialogue where your character is told what just happened in a scene that the reader has already read. Pointless bickering like did not did, did too. I find it very very hard to conduct a dialogue scene if there are more than five people talking. It's really hard to um, include all five people and keep them distinct. One or two are bound to disappear and that is going to happen so either accept that or reduce the number of people in the room and have a smaller conversation. Whining is usually not a good um, way to fill a dialogue. People don't like to hear it even if they're reading it, but I don't want to be a princess mother. And also agreement is pretty meaningless. I don't like her. I don't either, unless it's a huge surprise. So I know you're not going to memorize this, but if you're watching this workshop, you can download this uh, little handout right here. And if you're working on a story and you don't know what to do with your characters, go through this list and you might say, aha, a confession, or aha, a breakdown. So I wanna give us a little practice formatting dialogue. And the reason that we're going to do this is because often uh, writers get stuck wondering where to uh, make the break between one paragraph and another. So um, I'm going to pull up a word uh, version of that same handout, and we're going to read through it and break the paragraphs. Okay, are you ready to practice? Here we go. So to this story, we're going to indent paragraphs and start new paragraphs, and we're gonna put dialogue tags around the lines. And I'll read the story aloud and you'll watch what happens. At two in the morning, I woke abruptly to the sound of the phone ringing. A pile of half graded essays slid off my stomach onto the bed. Hello, I said sleepily. 
notice that commas and periods always go inside the quotation mark. A red bird flies at morning, a strange man's deep voice mumbled cryptically. We started a new paragraph because a new speaker has come in. Huh? I said, who is this? Is this you, James? You're putting me on, right? And notice that even though we have three sentences here, it's all one line of dialogue. So the quotation marks start only here and end only here. This is Boris, said the man's voice. Surely you remember the captain of the guard at the Winter Palace. It was I who saved your life, Anastasia. Now, even though the next line doesn't start with dialogue, it is a change of who is in focus. I scoffed in disbelief. Anastasia, this isn't Anastasia, I told whoever it was. I never even heard of any Anastasia. That is because you have been taught to forget, said Boris. Let me repeat, the red bird flies at morning. We used to sing that song together, remember? It is called Red Bird. You used to say, oh, Boris, I love the way you sing to me. Now I did this one because sometimes you have a quote within a quote. This is someone saying what someone else said. And also sometimes we might have something that's normally put in quote marks, like the name of a song. If it's within another set of quote marks, you always use single quotes, which is used with the apostrophe mark. I was sitting up in bed now. You've been watching too many late night movies. I was beginning to get scared. You're confusing me with that dead rushed princess. Well, I saw that movie Anastasia too. And she died like a hundred years ago. I hung up the phone and tried to get back to sleep but I tossed and turned all night, imagining scenarios which might possibly lead to someone calling me. A crank, a former student who had gotten an F in English 60, a psychopath. In the morning, I retrieved my daily copy of the Enterprise Record and sat down to read. Blaring headlines on the front page said, Russian mobster kills two in mysterious shootout. It's a headline. So we're gonna put it in quotation marks. I read down the page, my heart beating fast. The story continued. Boris Gurev, a former member of Russia's military police is in custody today after the shooting of two known Russian gangsters. He claimed that he had foiled a plot against the last remaining heir to the Russian throne. So this is a direct quote from the story. So we're putting that in quotation marks too. I looked at the grainy newspaper photo. Something stirred in the recesses of my memory. Boris. This is some good interior monologue that maybe we can put in present tense. It all came back to me then, along with the haunting melody of Redbird. Okay, so I know this took a while, but I hope it was an instructive little practice because what you can see is that in this short scene, which has action and dialogue and interior monologue. We've got a lot of paragraphs. We started a new paragraph every time the speaker changed and every time um, the focus changed. So uh, what I'm gonna do now is bring us back to our Padlet. And this is the full version of this, which you can download and practice with on your own if you like. Now that you know what a page of dialogue should look like, let's concentrate on how you write it. So I've got a little practice here for you called, let's write a dialogue scene.
let's say you want to write a scene where two characters are talking about murdering someone. I'm kind of funny that way. I'm always murdering someone in my stories. First rule is never to just have them agree about something so momentous. Can you put them at cross purposes and re reveal something important about one of them? One could be eager, the other reluctant. You know, going into the scene that your end goal is to have your point of view character make a decision about which side she's on. Start by doing nothing more than bulleting out your dialogue. This is exactly how I write a scene. So I named my characters Analia and Darius because I like names like that. Analia says, it's been two days and he hasn't told us anything. How long are we going to keep him locked in that room? Darius says, until we know the truth. He can't keep it hidden forever. If he's tainted, we can't afford to chance it. Analia says, what do you mean, chance what? Darius says, he may not even know it himself, but what if there's a monster inside him waiting to come out? Analia, how could he not know it? Darius, I've seen it before. One minute they're calm and friendly, talking like a regular person. The next they're ripping your throat out. That's what we've got to decide here. Analia says, so Corey's got to die. It would be like putting him out of his misery. So these are my seven exchanges of dialogue, but I'm going to turn this into a scene that is much more developed than that. By the way, I think seven exchanges is a long enough conversation for most scenes. All I was trying to do in this first run through was come up with dialogue that would force a character's decision and I didn't wanna to move too fast. Yes, I could have written all of this in just two lines. We're gonna to have to kill him. There's a monster inside him and we can't risk it getting out on Aaliyah. I guess I'm okay with it if it keeps everyone else safe. Sure, I could have done it in two lines, but in such a brief exchange, there's no conflict coming out in the dialogue and no character development. So when I first start creating a dialogue scene when I'm working on a chapter of a novel, I don't bring in any dialogue tags or attribution. I don't think about the setting yet and I haven't developed any interior monologue. That's all to come. But what I do have is one, a character who has come to a decision, two, a major step forward in the plot, and three, dialogue that sounds real. I know because I whispered it aloud while I was writing it. Notice also that in these seven exchanges, there are five questions asked. Not all of them are answered directly. Leaving questions unanswered is another way to create tension. See, so up here, here's a question, here's a question, here's a question, here's a question, and here's a question. And I only answered one. The next step in developing my scene is to establish a setting. Always choose a setting that adds to the conflict and challenges the characters. Make setting work for you. Give your characters something to do. It's the kiss of death to sit your characters across from each other in two chairs and just have them talk. I like to make at least one of my characters uncomfortable in the setting. And I always start with a strong setting image. So here's how I decided to start my scene. Analia wrinkled her nose at the urine sloshing in the bottom of the bucket. She walked carefully down the corridor and poured it into the gray metal sink in the corner of the basement work area. Notice that I opened with smell imagery. One of the most effective connections you can make with a reader goes straight to the amygdala, where the emotions are. <clears throat> now I'm going to start adding in her interior monologue, especially emotional, since she's my point of view character. I'm going to add expressions on my other character's face to hint at how he's feeling. And I'm going to add more setting detail. I'll use gestures and actions to use as attribution for the dialogue instead of just using dialogue tags like said and asked. Starting again, Analia wrinkled her nose at the urine sloshing in the bottom of the bucket. She walked carefully down the corridor and poured it into the gray metal sink in the corner of the basement work area. Turning from the sink, she heard the sound of keys in the cell door at the other end of the hall. Darius was coming. Notice I use another appeal to the senses, sound, almost as good as smell, right away to bring the reader into the scene. She set the bucket under the sink as she waited for him. It's been two days and he hasn't told us anything. How long are we going to keep him locked in that room? Darius had the prisoner's food tray. Almost nothing had been touched. 
until we know the truth. He dumped the food remnants into the garbage can and dropped the tray into the sink with a clatter. He can't keep it hidden forever. If he's tainted, we can't afford to chance it. Analia kept the fear from her face. What do you mean, chance what? Watching her carefully, Darius explained as if he were talking to a child. He may not even know it himself, but what if there's a monster inside him waiting to come out? He must really think she knew how this infection worked. Analia turned on the faucet and rinsed off the tray, resenting his assumption that she would do all the cleaning up. What would it be next? Washing the prisoner's corpse. She hoped not. She had then talked about killing him, but she wasn't going to raise the possibility. Stick to today's problem. She handed the wet tray to Darius along with the towel. If there's a monster inside him, how could he not know it? Now notice what I had, what I did here. I gave Darius something to do. And uh, I gave Analia fear. Then I gave him, since he's not my point of view character, a description from the outside. Look at this paragraph. Um, until I created this need to wash and dry a tray, I didn't really have a way into Analia's thoughts and I couldn't really name them, but they all come out here. Resentment, fear, dread. When writing a dialogue scene, don't skimp on the internal monologue. In this last paragraph I wrote, there's half a line of action, three and a half lines of internal monologue and less than a line of dialogue. The internal monologue should set up what the characters say. Try to make one flow out of the other. So here's her action. She turns off the faucet, rinse the tray. And then she's thinking about that and it flows to her dialogue. In my original outline, here's what I have Darius say next. I've seen it before. One minute they're calm and friendly talking like a regular person. The next they're ripping your throat out. That's what we've got to decide here. Before I can have him speak, I'll let him react to what Analia said give him an expression, a bit of action and gesture, and use it to divide up these four sentences of speech. None of this will include internal monologue because he's not my point of view character. You don't wanna switch points of view in the middle of the scene. So she said, if there's a monster inside him, how could he not know it? The unhappy grin on Darius's face was one of astonishment. I've seen it before. His eyes seemed to glaze over for a second like he was remembering. One minute they're calm and friendly, talking like a regular person. The next they're ripping your throat out. He was still holding the dish towel, gripping it tightly with both hands, like he was afraid to let it go. When he finally returned her gaze, something had changed in his stance. His shoulders were hunched now, and any trace of cheer had gone from his voice. That's what we've got to decide here. So this right here has suddenly given Darius so much more depth. It's raised the stakes and we could see emotion from him too. Most of the time you should end your dialogue scene in the point of view character's head, showing their reaction and suggesting what they are going to do next. So here's Analia. Analia felt almost sick as the truth of what they were doing here began to sink in. There had never been any, any chance of letting Corey go. She'd been lying to herself this whole time, letting herself be carried along without asking any questions. She might as well say it aloud. It came out much more calmly than she expected it to. So Corey's got to die. It would be like putting him out of his misery. Now this dialogue scene is a complete mix of description, action, dialogue, and thought. It moves the plot, it reveals character, and it creates tension. And you want to strive for that kind of mix. Look how much more developed it is than these original seven lines where we could have just had Analia said, Darius said, Analia replied, Darius argued, Analia said, asked, and it wouldn't have done very much for us. It would have been almost talking heads. So one of the things that I've included in your uh, Padlet here of handouts is practice for you to write a dialogue scene right here. I've also given you a fun cartoon about subtext, and I've given you some pictures where you can come up with dialogue and then 
bring in the pieces needed to make it into a scene. I've given you the rules of how to write interior monologue, and I've given you a good handout on attribution. I've laid a lot on you here, and I haven't even talked about um, all of it. The good news is that you can download all these handouts and practice with them. If you've enjoyed this workshop, consider coming to Butte College next fall, taking English 60 with me. That's the fiction writing class. I'll introduce you to some good stories and give you the opportunity to write your own. Don't hesitate to send me an email at emmonsmo at butte.edu.